we are inching towards the climax of this very interesting discussion about many electron atoms. And uh, to keep things simple uh, our discussion has been limited to helium and that is how it is going to be for this course. Uh, we have talked about uh, variation method, we have talked about perturbation theory today and maybe uh, in a couple of more modules or one more module we are going to talk about Hartree-Fock equations and how Hartree-Fock equations are handled by using something called self consistent fields. And what you see here is from Wikipedia it is an algorithm of how this uh, self consistent fields are used to handle Hartree-Fock equations. So, we will slowly see how it makes sense. What I would like you to uh, note now is that it is an iterative method. You have to go around do, do the calculations again and again and again and then keep improving your results. That is uh, in a very very simple manner how it works. Okay. So, so far what we have been able to achieve is that by using a variational method for helium we have been able to uh, reach what we had talked about earlier the effective nuclear charge. We had written down our Hamiltonian in atomic units and the trial wave function that we are using is very simple. It is the same kind of wave function that we had talked about earlier that we encountered during orbital approximation. Psi 1 s is the same orbital that you get when you talked about hydrogen atom. The only difference is that one of the psi 1 s wave functions is written in terms of the coordinates of electron number 1, the other is written in terms of coordinates of electron number 2 that is all. So, using this we define this functional epsilon as integral phi h hat phi over all space uh, in this case over r let us say or r theta phi whatever it is. Now, the thing is we used the uh, atomic number z as a variational parameter. And we did that consciously because we know that the atomic number seen by an electron in the presence of the other is uh, less than the full value that is there. So, uh, that is why we expect that the uh, value of z will keep decreasing. One way of doing it is taking z minus sigma, the other way of doing it is by taking a fraction. So, here uh, we are sort of taking it like a fraction, but then of course, we can subtract it from the original uh, atomic number and uh, get the effective atomic number, uh, get the shielding constant rather. So, this is a variational parameter. So, what we do is we minimize epsilon with respect to z and at uh, the minimum value of it we say that z is equal to z effective. So, z effective turns out to be 1.6875 and hence one can calculate sigma and E min turns out to be minus 77.49 electron volt which is close to the actual value. But uh, well not close enough. If it was close enough then we could have closed the discussion right here. Next we said that uh, it makes sense to look at ionization energies because when we look at ionization energies uh, the fact that we do not really have an excellent agreement is highlighted a little uh, more. So, we see that the uh, difference in uh, the number that we get using variation method and the experimental number is about 1.5 electron volt which is sort of the strength of a chemical bond. So, it is non trivial right. So, there is uh, room for doing better and in trying to do better what one uh, does first is that one can use more general trial wave functions. There is no need of sticking to uh, hydrogen atom like wave functions. So, the first kind of wave functions that one can use are slated type orbitals. Uh, there is still one electron wave functions that is why we call them orbitals. So, slated type orbitals are functions of r theta and phi as usual. Uh, we could write them in terms of uh, x, y, z, but as we know uh, it, it makes more sense to write them in terms of uh, spherical polar coordinates. It is easier to handle that way and that turns out to be a number a normalization constant multiplied by r to the power n minus 1 multiplied by e to the power minus zeta r. Instead of z we have written zeta where zeta is a variational parameter and that is multiplied by uh, an angular part. So, we have uh, something similar to the hydrogen atom wave functions once again uh, we have a radial part multiplied by an angular part, but something is missing here right. What is missing? What is missing is that uh, Laguerre polynomial remember Laguerre polynomial that polynomial is not even here 
right. We have an exponential decay in R, we have uh, this uh, R to the power uh, something and uh, we have the angular part right. So, here not only is zeta the variational parameter, but n is also a variational parameter and we discuss this uh, in the previous module. Uh, when we talk about hydrogen atoms n can only take up integral values not so when you use these as starting points as trial functions you want to play around with n as well uh, because you do not really uh, care too much about whether they are integral or not. So, you are going to get values of n something like 0 0.9, 0 0.8 whatever ok. Now, so uh, when we use this uh, product of stator orbitals as trial wave function for variational treatment we get a value of E of minus 2.8617 atomic unit and ionization energy of 23.4 electron volt which is called the Hartree-Fock limit ok. Before leaving this discussion let me just reiterate that first of all these slater type orbitals form a complete set. However, the radial parts are not orthogonal to each other precisely because that Laguerre -like polynomial whatever polynomial it is that is missing. Remember orthonormality in all these wave functions we talked about. Uh, may it be for your uh, rigid rotor, harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom all the orthonormality uh, well orthogonality uh, came from the polynomials that were present there like your polynomial, legendary polynomial and so on and so forth ok, Hermite polynomial. So, since the polynomial is not here they are not orthogonal to each other let us remember that we are not working with orthogonal functions. And as we said earlier there is no radial node again because there is no polynomial you equate this to 0 where will it be equal to 0 at infinity nowhere else. But you can have angular nodes because the angular part is there and uh, there is no guarantee that the angular part will be such that it would not be equal to 0 at uh, some value of theta some value of phi, phi right. So, these are uh, close to hydrogen atom wave functions but not quite and they include variational parameters. The other kind of orbitals that I want to just mention here are Gaussian type orbitals. So, these are very important and the starting point of uh, well I have said it 2-3 times already, but they are starting point of computational chemistry in big way. So, much so that the uh, perhaps the most popular uh, quantum chemistry uh, computational quantum chemistry program that is used worldwide is called Gaussian this is where it derives the name from, from Gaussian type orbitals. So, the difference between Slater type orbitals and Gaussian type orbitals is that in Gaussian type orbitals uh, you do not use an exponential function rather you use a Gaussian function. It is not e to the power minus zeta r rather it is e to the power minus alpha r square. Again alpha is a variational parameter and n is a uh, variation parameter as well. The advantage of using Gaussian type orbitals you might remember uh, we had shown at one place when we used uh, exponential function and, uh, no when you use the Gaussian function actually there was not a good match at the top, but then you can use uh, a lot of uh, terms and take sums and make up for that ok. So, once again this is a complete set and once again radial parts are not orthogonal to each other precisely because the uh, polynomial is missing for the same reason there is no radial node. Now, uh, when you use this Gaussian type orbitals what you get is if you use one orbital you get very poor measure of electron density near the nucleus and that we have discussed earlier remember because uh, if you try to model 1s, 1s is like this and Gaussian has a some something like this. So, uh, poor measure of electron density not only near but also very far away from the nucleus. So, to make up for that what do we do? We do what we have discussed already we take linear combinations. We take a large number of GTOs use linear combinations and that brings in an additional or not an additional an additional type of variational parameter in the form of the coefficients of these terms. Coefficients also become a variational parameter. So, that way more parameters we are happy in any case we have upper limit theorem we cannot do better than the best we cannot go below the actual energy. So, we happily add terms to the extent that our computational power allows us. And this opens up the uh, field for more exotic basis functions. If you actually use Gaussian or Gamis or any other uh, computational chemistry program you will see there are a lot of basis functions that you could choose from and different basis functions basis sets 
are good in different situations. Okay? This here is the beginning of all that the tip of the iceberg. Great. With that background let us now discuss how uh, this Hartree-Fock equations for helium uh, come and how they are handled. Once again we are not really going to uh, try and write down every mathematical step because that would be too much and uh, it makes no sense also. Do you have to remember a lot of things? No. What do you have to remember? This. This is what is written here. The wave function used in Hartree-Fock uh, method is still within the ambit of orbital approximation. Please remember this. It is a product of two one electron wave functions. Hydrogen atom wave functions are not that will come to later, but they are orbitals one electron wave function. Okay? Right. So, uh, what we do is first of all we uh, note something. We note that the probability distribution of electron number 2 is phi star phi dr2. We are talking about electron 2 right. So, this is phi the orbital written in terms of coordinates of 2 electron number 2 that is r2. When I write r in uh, bold letter what I mean is that that could mean r theta phi or x y z or something like that it just does not mean one coordinate it means coordinate system combination of all the coordinates for electron number 2. So, capital R would mean r2 theta 2 phi 2 something like that okay? or x2 y2 z2. So, phi star phi dr2 as we know gives us the probability distribution of electron 2 phi star phi gives probability density. In case you are confused about this please go back and uh, have a look at the discussion we had done while talking about hydrogen atom orbitals a uh, few weeks ago. Now since this is the probability density what happens if I multiply it by electron charge? Yeah, I should get charge density. So, this probability density is uh, a measure of what is in classical mechanics called charge distribution. Okay? That is a very important starting point of Hartree-Fock method. Okay? So, what we do next is that we write down an expression for the effective potential energy of electron number 1 at point R1, R1 theta 1 phi 1 capital R well not capital sorry bold R1 bold R1 means a particular point characterized by say R1 theta 1 phi 1. So, what is the effective potential energy of electron number 1 at its instantaneous position which we denote by bold R1 due to electron number 2. So, what is the potential exerted by electron number 2 on electron number 1 at an instant at the position of electron number 1 denoted by bold R1. I have said it I have done uh, as many <laughs> permutations and combinations of the words in that sentence I hope you understood one of them. Okay? So, this effective potential what will it be we all know the uh, formula for potential energy from electrostatics if we relate it to our knowledge of quantum mechanics this is what it will be. We call it u1 effective at r1 and that would be equal to integral phi star r2 1 by r12 phi r2. What is r12? r12 is the separation between electron number 1 and electron number 2. So, this is the average value of the potential energy that we get and we call it the effective potential. Of course, if you could measure at different times of course, you would get different values. That is why uh, as we know we in quantum mechanics we only handle we only work with average values. Okay? This is the effective or average value of potential of electron number 1 in its own position due to the presence of electron number 2 because they are going to repel each other. right? Okay. So, this is how we define u1 effective. Great. Knowing that can we write down an effective one electron Hamiltonian for electron number 1? What is Hamiltonian? Total energy operator. right? So, total energy operator would involve kinetic energy as well as potential energy. Uh, if we talk about a one electron system kinetic energy is given by that minus del square by 2 in atomic unit right minus h cross square by 2 m into del square. So, uh, if we write in atomic units it is just minus half into del square that is kinetic energy. For one electron system what is the potential energy? 
just 1 by r or 1 by r1 in this case. What is the additional term I would get in this effective 1 electron Hamiltonian for electron number 1 for helium? This uh, u1 effective also has to be included, right. So, the effective Hamiltonian for electron number 1, one would be minus half del 1 square minus z by r1 this is for the attraction of the electron with the nucleus plus u1 effective at r1. This is our uh, effective 1 electron Hamilton and remember 1 electron ok. So, we are going step by step we are uh, building the problem. So, now that we know the Hamiltonian it is very easy for us to write Schrodinger equation whether we can solve it for now or not that is a different question altogether we will cross that bridge when we come to it. But we can write right. So, the Schrodinger equation that we can write is going to be well h psi equal to e psi we know what psi is is the product of the two uh, 1 electron wave functions we know what the Hamiltonian is effective uh, 1 electron Hamiltonian. So, we just write the Schrodinger equation like this remember this Schrodinger equation for 1 electron ok. So, uh, I am not using the product here. So, I, I had gone and uh, I got a little distracted one minute ago sorry. So, I am just working with the 1 electron wave function here. So, this here is your Hartree-Fock equation and this Hartree-Fock equation yields the best orbital one wave function that you can get for helium ok orbital wave function. Uh, when we talk about 1 electron wave functions when you want to retain the memory of hydrogen atom. Uh, then Hartree-Fock equation works best ok. In more advanced theories we forsake the concept of orbitals and we go ahead and uh, so I have heard uh, practitioners of quantum chemistry of now uh, saying something that would seem to be perhaps very cheeky to you I have heard them saying there is no such thing as orbitals ok. Uh, let us not get so advanced right now for now we will use orbitals it works fine for us great. So, now that is the equation that we wrote from a sort of common sense. You can arrive at the same equation we are not going to go uh, all the way in this discussion, but uh, we will still go through this because it introduces to us a very important quantity ok. You could arrive at Hartree-Fock equation from variational principle also. How? You start with this trial wave function then you define energy. What is energy? Expectation value integral phi r 1 star phi r 2 star left multiplying Hamiltonian operating on phi r 1 phi r 2 over all function space. What is the Hamiltonian? We know what the Hamiltonian is in atomic unit. All right, so let us just plug in this expression for Hamiltonian in the expression for energy and see what we get. How many terms will we get? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. What is the first term? Integral phi r 1 phi r 2 left multiplying minus half del 1 square operating on phi r 1 phi r 2. Okay. Uh, what happens when uh, this minus half del 1 square operates on the product of phi r 1 phi r 2 phi r phi of r 1 phi of r 2. Phi of r 2 is not a function of r 1 right. So, as far as this del 1 square is concerned it is just a constant. So, it would come out and del 1 square minus half del 1 square would operate on phi r 1 to yield the kinetic energy which would, which would be a constant ok. And it is important to understand that this what we have written in bracket notation is really a double integral yeah. So, just write it so this thing is I will write it then I erase it also because otherwise it will overlap with something else this is really equal to integral I will write two integral signs. 1 for r 1 1 for r 2 phi of r 1 star phi of r 2 star 
then we have the Hamiltonian operating on ah, why did I put a bracket there phi of r 1 phi of r 2 d r 1 d r 2 right and this Hamiltonian that we have is entirely uh, well we have something uh, the first time in Hamiltonian is entirely in terms of 1. So, uh, if I just take the first term I do not take all of h or I just take the first term then it is going to be something like this minus half del 1 square and you understand that del 1 square is going to operate on phi of r 1 but not on phi of r 2 right. So, this double integral conveniently becomes a product of two integrals integral of phi of r 1 star multiplied by minus half del 1 square operating on phi of r 1 d r 1 is the first integral multiplied by the second integral is phi of r 2 star multiplied by phi of r 2 d r 2 alright. And the good thing is that if this one is either normalized or we can normalize it. So, this is going to become 1. So, in the first term when we expand this when we expand this Hamiltonian and put in all these 5 terms I am actually going to get single integrals instead of double integrals because one of them is going to get normalized and therefore will be equal to 1 right. So, this is something that I wanted to bring your attention to uh, in case somebody uh, missed it if I skipped it and just went on. This one is not really written explicitly in the books that we are following. Uh, by the way uh, today we are following McQuaddy's book. I will at the end of the discussion I will uh, have a word to say about something that is there in your uh, pillars book, but we will not do it explicitly. Okay. So, oh, I have to erase that equal to sign also, okay. forget it. All right. So, this is what we have, this is uh, the first one, I have not got rid of phi of r 2 yet. Okay. So, integral minus half, well, minus half integral phi of r 1 multiplied by phi of r 2 del 1 square phi of r 1 phi of r 2 minus a similar term, but this time in terms of electron number 2 and ele not electron number 1. The third term will be minus z, so this one right. Again the same thing will happen, once again this is a double integral and we can make it a product of two integrals, one in terms of 1, one in terms of 2 and the one in terms of 1, uh, sorry the one in terms of 2 is going to become 1. Similar thing here the only difference is that this time it is the turn of the uh, integral in R 1 to become 1. So, the triple product in electron number 2 terms is going to survive well is going to remain uh, like that. Okay. And what is the last one? In the last one we cannot separate like that. Okay. No matter how much we like separating this 1 and 2 well I have not shown you the separation yet I will show you in a minute no matter how much you might have liked it we cannot do it here because here we have 1 by r 1 2 separation between electron number 1 and electron number 2 there is nothing we can do about it. Okay. So, uh, this has to contain terms in 1 as well as 2 it has to remain like that. Okay. So, the first one uh, what we will do is we will collect the terms in 1 and here you see we have got rid of uh, terms uh, the factor of 2 because that integral has become equal to 1 by normalization. So, this integral becomes integral phi of in r 1 star left multiplying minus del 1 square by 2 minus z by r 1 operating on phi r 1. What is it? Do you recognize it? Do you recognize it? It is actually your uh, it is a it is like expectation value of energy for a 1 electron system is not it? Yeah. This is the uh, kinetic energy term of Hamiltonian, this is a potential energy term 
when the, the only thing that is there is attraction of nucleus and electron. So, if the second electron is not there then this is going to be the actually the expression for the energy of electron number 1. Similarly, the second term in electron number 2 is going to be the expression for energy of electron number 2 in absence of electron number 1. Suppose it is helium ion H plus then this will be uh, the average value of energy. Okay. How did I get this? Uh, remember there are 5 terms I have already written 4 of them condensed in these 2 terms there is a minus sign here, there is a minus sign here. So, there is a combination of 2 terms potential kinetic energy potential energy of 1 this is also combination of 2 terms kinetic energy potential energy of 2 right. So, 4 terms are actually written after simplifying after converting the double integrals to a product of 2 integrals and finally only 1 integral last one remains intact. Okay. So, what we do is we call this first integral I1. Uh, we had encountered this earlier also remember when we could not work out an integral or even when there was some hope of working out an integral later on we gave it a name and we worked with it. Remember Sij yeah, or H11 all those things we, we are not familiar with. So, similarly we will call this one I1 we will call this to I2 collectively they belong to the family II okay. and this one we will call J. So, I will get I1 plus I2 plus J12. This subscript means which electron coordinates this integral has contributions from. The last integral J12 has uh, is made up of coordinates of electron number 1 as well as electron number 2. So, it is called J12 and it has a name also the name is Coulomb integral. Now, why Coulomb integral? Okay, just think what is it that you uh, know about uh, uh, in which context have you heard the name of Coulomb? Coulomb attraction remember Coulomb attraction. So, the same thing right. So, uh, electrostatics. So, Coulomb integral essentially stands for an electrostatic interaction well repulsion between electron number 1 and electron number 2 not very difficult to see from here. So, later on we are going to encounter when we talk about uh, bonding we will uh, uh, encounter Coulomb integral once again. Additionally, we will encounter something called an exchange integral and as we will see it is not possible for us to uh, have a classical mechanical analog of exchange integral. Coulomb integral we can uh, sort of make sense of it by classical mechanics not so for exchange integral which will come when we introduce one more nucleus right now we do not have to worry about it. Okay. So, the way you get Hartree-Fock equation from here is that you minimize E with respect to phi and that leads you to the Hartree-Fock equation that we have discussed earlier. Okay. So, that in a nutshell is Hartree-Fock equation for you. Will we be able to solve it? Do we need some trick to solve it? We will take that in the next module.